might be a light day in terms of attendance. So, um, let's jump in to your questions first about the homework that's going to be due. One comment was that, that we didn't review enough. <laughs> Maybe I should do it in moments of the gamma ren variable. If you don't have any questions. Are there any comments? I didn't do your test yet. The tests were pretty good. Um, I think people missed some problems here and there. Um, but. Well, it was more than fair to adhere so closely to the stay sheet. <laughs> it was kind of fair, but on the other hand, people then looked at the problem and said, oh, that's the same as the study sheet. And then they got messed up. Because on the first problem with A, B, the area of a circle, and so on, let well, that have the exponential density. Some people didn't see. It made it a little easier. So I gave you the easier version of the problem, flip it around. But it might have been easier for some of them to just said, like, a be the area of a square. Yeah, exactly. You know, so they wouldn't get all messed up and thought it was the same problem. Um, read the problem. Please read the problem. And on number six, I was really asking for describe the random variable. Uh, most people knew what they were doing on this problem. I could tell that, but they didn't always follow the instructions. Uh, I wanted the definition of a geometric random variable. Um, Extra credit problem, only a couple people did much on it. Uh, everybody did like number five real well. I, I was happy about that. That was the most complicated problem and everybody aced it. Um, people had trouble number four. Number four, the, um, given the uniform density and, and the conditional density by the unconditional density. That should have been straightforward, I think, but having trouble with that. Test um, number four. Test problem number four. It was given that f x was uniform on the unit interval. Most people understood that. I didn't write it down. I think part of the problem was the language of this course, where things can be written out in words, and they are saying some things but not everybody can understand it unless it's written down in formulas. So I basically said x is uniform in the unit interval. Um, not everybody could translate. What does that mean in terms of the density? So that was part of the problem. This means that, that the density of x is 1. It's less than 1. Okay? And then I gave you the conditional density, also only in words. So that was part of the problem. What is if y is uniform on 1 to x, that means that the conditional density of y is 1 over x minus 0. 0 less than y less than x, or x fixed and y ranging from 0 to x. Okay, so you have to write those together. Then you multiply those together to get the joint density, which many people did correctly. 1 times 1 over x for 0 less than x less than less y less than x. That was pretty similar to the, that's the joint density. So that's a function of two variables. Here I'm thinking this is a function of one variable y for fixed x. Okay. And that's the joint density. Then you find the marginal density, f sub y. y equals the integral over uh, the joint density over all x. But then, of course, that becomes only a certain interval. X goes from y to 1. Because I'm freezing y now when x range from the lower boundary to the upper boundary. So 1 over x dx equals log x from y to 1. Well, it's log 1 minus log y to 1 minus log y. That's the density. I did that one in class once. Um, I was hoping to reproduce it. So, uh, there was some trouble with that problem. But all in all, I thought it was a pretty good result. I didn't write 
and not averages. Okay. Um, all right. Any comments or questions about the homework right now? I had some requests for, can you delay it? Has anybody even tried it? Yeah, bang through a bunch of them. I found, since they're all even numbered problems, there aren't answers, and so I okay. simulated a I lot of them to get answers. I can give you, okay, you can do some simulation to get answers. I can give you some answers. Why don't I, why don't I give you some answers? answers. Um, because getting there is the journey. <laughs> okay. Why don't we do the answers to the problems? See if you can get more compatibility. Chapter 4, number 2, 4, 20 is the grad problem, uh, 32, 34, oh, they're all even numbers, 40 and 42. Um, number 2, you had to know some, uh, also there's some series you need to know. You need to know the series of the first uh, K integers, K goes from 1 to n, you need to know this. And you need to know that summation K squared, K goes from 1 to n, is n, n plus 1, 2n plus 1 all over 6. This is a hint, okay? So I think I'll just do that and then see if we can get the rest of the answer, okay? We don't have to prove anything. No, you don't have to right? prove it, okay? Get the rest of the answer from there. Um, well, I guess I can tell you what the variance is. The variance of x is going to be m squared minus 1 over 12. All right. Okay. That would probably want to select algebra in that problem. Okay. Um, four. Um, it's pretty simple, but um, a expected value of x is alpha, alpha minus 1, or alpha bigger than 1. Expected value of x squared is alpha over alpha minus 2, or alpha bigger than 2. Okay. And I won't tell you, therefore you get a formula for the variance, but I just want you to bother with that. Okay, you can calculate the variance from there and do the algebra. Uh, for number 20, the grad problem, the answer is infinity. Okay, <laughs> that's easy. Okay. That's why it wouldn't work. Okay. <laughs> okay. I simulated the sucker. Smart. I had a nice U-shaped curve. I tried to, you know, compute the area under it, see if I'd get a hint. <laughs> and you got? It wouldn't compute. I mean, it just it kept okay. running off the end. Okay. And, you know, I was trying to do these evaluations. Well, oh, see, that's what happens. <laughs> it's nice to know a little theory so that you should be able to, you know, you know, you know when your simulation isn't working. Aha! You know, there's an infinite expectation. So it's nice to have a little bit of theory. 432, um, let's see, it was lambda over alpha minus 1. Again, we're alpha bigger than 1. And 434. I think the common answer is two thirds. Is that you wouldn't have any problem. E x equals two thirds. They're asking you to do it two different ways, though. Okay? I'm not showing you how to do that uh, here. And number 40, I believe the answer is 997. The answer will tell you how to do it. That's one back to the fourth. Okay? And for the last one, there's a table. Uh, but I will give you the hint. If you have an exponential random variable, if x, and I'll go over this right now, if x is exponential with parameter lambda, then e of x equals 1 over lambda and the uh, standard deviation of x also 1 over lambda. Okay. That might even be in the back of the book. Okay. Let's see if that's in the back of the book. That's standard deviation? Yeah. So that's sigma. Yeah, sigma is the standard notation of the standard deviation, but here it, of course, depends on the actual parameter of the uh, variable. Do they have a 
Let's first just go ahead and find the mean of the exponential and the expectation of the square and so on. For an exponential, let's do some things. First, just for the exponential, then we'll do the gamma. So we can layer this on in several coats of paint, so to speak. So let x be exponential parameter lambda. So now we know what it's, and everybody knows what its density is, f sub x of x equals uh, lambda e to the minus lambda x, x greater than zero. What's the expected value of x? How do you do that? We went through that formula before. We did do the introduction on expected mm -hmm. value. You take the probability that the value is about x, that's f of x dx. Okay, that's the probability, all right? Then you multiply it by x, and you add, okay? When you do that, then it's integral 0 to infinity of x times lambda e to the minus lambda x dx. Okay. So, how do you do that integral? First, I would make a substitution, though. That's get the lambda out of that. Yeah, u equals lambda x. This technique. du is lambda dx. So there's my du. Then how do I, and here's my u up here. Okay. Then what do I do with the x? And I have to write x equals u over lambda. Okay. And so I get integral zero to uh, lambda. Oh, excuse me. U also goes from zero to infinity. Back as a positive constant. So I get u over lambda e to the minus u du. Okay. So what happens is. All the lambda dependence is now outside the integral, and I just have an, an integral, u e to the minus u du. And then the only question is, what is that? What is that integral? It doesn't depend on anything, on any parameter. It's just a number. And you can look it up in a table of integrals, or you can do integration by parts. Yes, sir? When we're doing integration, um on the homework. Do you expect us to show work? Generally, yes. Generally, yes. 
Okay, so you can't type in your calculator and say. Well, hey, okay. I mean. <laughs> like MATLAB or something. Yeah, I guess you could. You had to. I don't like it. I'd rather do have you do it. There are some tricks I can teach you. Okay. One of them is that I have a table of we do we have this that we have established a short table of integrals, um, and that is from the gamma density from the definition of the of the, of the gamma function. Mm -hmm. We do have a short table of integrals, and this this integral x to the alpha minus one e to the minus x dx is equal to gamma of alpha. Let's go to infinity. So we actually know this. Okay. <laughs> That's one of our, so I can do that for any real alpha positive. So alpha is, if I take alpha equals to 2, that gives that, uh, that integral of x e to the minus x dx, 0 to the negative is gamma of 2. And that's when they question of what is gamma of 2. <laughs> but if we had a theorem that gamma of n is n minus 1 factorial, that is by integration by parts. Integration by parts gives you a recursion formula, namely that uh, n gamma of n is equal to gamma of n plus 1. So if you turn that around, that gives you this. Okay, alpha gamma of alpha is actually gamma of alpha plus 1 for any real positive parameter of alpha. Okay, that's you can obtain by integration by parts. This is integration by parts. So you do it once and you get a general result. Okay? Then you get this. So I can say this is uh, 1 factorial, which is 1. Okay? So this integral is 1. So I get 1 over lambda times 1 equals 1 over lambda. Okay? So that's the expected value. Uh, and the answer, yeah, pretty much. I'm looking to a table here. I'm looking at the table. I'm looking at what is this integral. All right. I just remind you that this is how I do it without using my calculator. Sweet. Okay. Yeah, it's, <laughs> okay. it's even faster. <laughs> I don't have to type it all in. So I just have a few formulas memorized. If you don't believe this, then I mean, if you haven't done this integration by parts, then you may not have to. This may not be so comfortable. Right, uh, but actually, you can see that if I multiply this by alpha, then you'd be all set up for an integration by parts, right? This would be the derivative of x to the alpha, then and it just it just falls out. <coughs> right, so this is the definition of gamma of alpha. I can put the definition sign here, we'll read it from right to left, right? And then it follows immediately that um, to get this formula. Okay. Because I think what gamma of one is just integral e to the minus six, so that's equal to one. That's pretty easy. So then you work it up. You go one, gamma of one is gamma of two. The gamma of one was one, so gamma of two is still just one. Two gamma of two is gamma of three. Gamma of three is two times one. So what about the variance? How do you find the variance? What is the variance? You had that in the first course, so I don't feel like I'm really spiking that much away from you by not going fully over what the definition of variance is. But the variance, okay. What is what is even the expectation of x squared? What's that? Let's do that for the exponential random variable. Maybe we can do that. I guess we have it here already practically, right? Do I have to find the density of x squared and then use this formula? Okay, two methods. A, find density of y equals x squared. All right, let's call that density g. Let's call that density x of y of y equals 
equals x squared and compute ey equals integral y, f sub y of y, dy. In other words, you need to take the probability that y is at the value of y and then multiply and then multiply times y. Alright? B is another type of method. There's another way to do this. Then it's find e of x squared. Well, you need to find, you need to consider all the probability that, that, uh, that I get the value of x squared, right? How do I get the probability, how do I get the value of x squared? Well, I get it by taking the value of x, then I'll automatically get x squared from x. <laughs> okay. I just won't go by x squared. So I don't have to do anything to have, except do this integral. This is a law of an unconscious statistician. Okay. Okay. I didn't. I don't have to compute the density of y first. And you don't have to put the um, x squared in the f of x. No. Here's the thing. This is a okay. How? Let's figure it this way. All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a, I'll, let's just recall how that works. Um, what? Okay. Proof of proof by example for method B. Let's take a discrete case. Let X equals minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, or 3, each with probability uh, 1 sixth. That'll suffice for the example, make it a really simple example, okay? What's the expected value? What's, okay, what's the, let's take y equals x squared, and let's go through method A then, okay? Then what's the density of y? So y, what are the values of y? Zero, one, four, nine are the four, four possible values of y. Okay? With probability, uh, one sixth, two sixths, two sixths, and one sixth. Okay? So there's only one three, so there's only Right, but there are two, there's a one and there's a minus one. So you get two six with the probability that y is one, and there's a two and a minus six. So there's two six with the probability you get a four. All right. So the expected value of y is equal to zero times a six plus one times two six plus four times two six plus nine times one six. But notice how I can rewrite this in a very natural way. The 2 6 I can write as 1 6 plus 1 6, right? Go backwards in this computation I just did. This is 0 times a 6 plus 1 plus minus 1 squared times a 6, okay? Plus 2 plus minus 2 squared each time to 6 plus, because the 2 6 came from 1 6 plus 1 6 plus 3 squared times a 6. Okay? So the probability density. I'm sorry, 2 squared. Yeah, there you go. Whether it's squared or not. Probability density, yeah, so now I'm just looking at the density of values of x. Alright? So, so what I'm doing is. is is what I'm doing. In other words, there's, bu the, there's a bunch of different x's that give you the x squared, right? right? x and minus x give you the x squared. And that comes out in the wash, right? In other words, this is the sum of all possible values of x squared, x squared um, equals y, right? But, so it's all possible sums, but so you basically get in other words, what it is is integral zero to infinity, because here I had minus infinity to infinity for the x, 
is 0 to infinity x squared times f of x of x plus f of x of minus x dx. Okay, in other words, you get the pro all the probabilities together, but that's going to come out in the wash. It's just going to grow by infinity to infinity x squared x dx. In other words, you take all possible x's that give you this answer, x squared, and add them together. So either I can integrate over the full range, my screen infinity of x, or I can integrate over half of the range, which is basically what they did here. Okay? Integrate over half of the range. So you just roll over the range of y values, 0, 1, 4, 9. Okay? But it's easy to just go ahead and just integrate over the full range of x. Take all the x squared to say come. Okay. Makes it a lot easier. Okay. So uh, that, those are the two methods. We can actually do it for the exponential density and Let's just see how ugly it gets by transforming it. What's the density of x squared? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think it's going to be ugly, but let's see. How would I get the density of x squared? Let's use a distribution function method, so that because that's less scary than most of the other methods. How would I find the density of x squared? So f sub y, let's see, the, the CDF of, of y is the probability that capital Y is less than the little y is equal to um, Um, probability of capital X squared is with a little y, which is the probability, let's see, since x is a positive random variable, that's just the probability that x is less than or equal to the square root of y. Okay? Which is equal to, since x is greater than or equal to zero. Okay? Which is equal to, um, some people did it this way, integral 0 to the square root of y, lambda e to the minus lambda x dx, did that on their paper, which is, comes out to be e to the minus lambda, minus e to the minus lambda x from 0 to the square root of y equals 1 minus e to the minus lambda square root of y. Okay? That's the distribution function. The density then is obtained by differentiating that. So this is method A. Or actually transform the random variable. Boy, the density is then just you have to differentiate that again. So we get lambda times one half y to the minus one half e to the minus lambda square root of y. Okay. Well, look, ugly looking things. Okay. So the expected value of y is equal therefore to Integral y times this density, lambda, times one half times y to the minus one half times mu to the minus lambda square root of y dy. And now you, you're in real trouble, zero to infinity. How to do that integral? You'd have to change variables and so on in order to do that integral. Right? So that's, you know, I guess what you can do is. By parts. Change variables back again is a lie. Yeah. So the problem is you got to square root of y up in here. Can you just, oh, I know. You can't sub. Well, you get y to the one half. You get, yeah, you put u equals y to the one half. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is, this is, okay, so this comes out lambda over 2 integral y to the one half e to the minus lambda y to the one half dy zero to infinity. So now I put u equals y to the one half, and it won't come out immediately, right? Um, but I'll, maybe I can get things to work out. So then, yeah, I can come back to the gamma integral probably. So u equals y to the one half du is one half y to the minus one half dy. Okay. So that means. Um, Let's see, I think u squared. Maybe we're going to put the lambda in. No, I won't put the lambda in. I won't put the lambda in until afterwards. So I'll get, first I'll do the y to the half, and then I'll bring the lambda. 
So then I'll have, so that means I'll have u squared du is y to the, is one half, or two u squared du is y to the one half dy. Why don't you just use the up, the top formula for that? Because I can't because this this is square root of y. This is square root. No, like the top formula. Huh? Since it's factored out, can't you just okay. use the half? Yeah, well, there's my u squared then. There's a u squared. Yeah, u squared. Okay. Two u squared is no. y to the one half dy. So, all right, what do you want to do? You just want to leave the one half in then? Okay. Yeah. Well, actually, leave the one half there. Okay. And then u squared is is one half y to the one half dy. However you do it, you're going to play with the constants. You can get them slightly different form, but so you get lambda integral of zero to infinity uh, u squared e to the minus lambda u du. I still got to get rid of the lambda. Okay. So I need to make another change of variable because I didn't do it all in one fell swoop. What's going to give you is going to give 2 over lambda. What's going to happen is you're going to get the same thing you did before over here, right? You, you know, the lambda times the exponent, I mean lambda times x kind of a thing. You get uh, an extra 1 over a lambda for every prefactor, okay? There's my lambda du there, and I have a u squared, so that u squared equals v over lambda, the quantity squared. Okay. So I'm going to get a 1 over lambda. I'm going to get this lambda is used up by the dv. Okay, and then I'm going to get another, I'm going to get a 1 over lambda squared coming in. So this becomes 1 over lambda squared times an interval 0 to infinity. Uh, v squared e to the minus v dv. Okay. <laughs> I guess we're going to do our calculus until we die. All right? And then that integral is gamma of 3, which is 2. So this comes out 2 over lambda squared. So after about a million pages of calculation, you get it. So this was a nasty way to do it. All right? It was not a good textbook problem. But if I just did it by method B, okay, I gave, again, I got that V squared e to the minus V to V. I didn't do any ratio of parts. Again, I just used my table of integrals. So that'll be equal to 3. And gamma of 3 is 2 factorial. So let's do method B. Let's find x to the of x squared the easy way, quote unquote easy way. In other words, I don't have to do any pre-calculations. I can just plug in the formula and then hope that everything works out. So integral now e x squared by method B, e of x squared is integral x squared lambda e to the minus lambda x dx, 0 to infinity. All right? Now the only problem, and I have to make one substitution in order to get rid of the lambda, just as before. So I'll do the substitution that I made before. U equals lambda x, du equals, you'll see it just as I did before. 
just now, lambda dx, right? And x squared is u over lambda, the quantity squared. So this becomes integral of 0 to infinity. Again, u goes from 0 to infinity as x does. u over lambda is the quantity squared, e to the minus u du. Because the lambda dx becomes my du. This is my du. That's why I'll organize it, so I get that, and so I just get 1 over lambda squared times the integral u squared e to the minus u du. So to infinity equals 2 over lambda squared, because we already went through that gamma integral. Okay? So there's the expectation value of the square. so-called second moment of the exponential. The nth moment is where I put in a power n on x. So, and you can do that. So what you can actually do is using the gamma density, you can get it all in one fell swoop. Okay? By using the identity that, um, that in fact you have even a fancier one, you have that x to the alpha minus 1 e to the minus lambda x, I could have put this one on. It's gamma alpha over lambda to the alpha. Okay? That's even nicer one. You memorize that one, then of course you don't have to make the change of variables every time. Okay, I could have used that um, basically here. Um, alpha was 3. Alpha was 3 for this. So I got lambda over times gamma 3 over lambda the third. That's how this would calculate out if without the change of variables. So this comes out to be lambda gamma 3 over lambda cubed equals 2 factorial over lambda squared. So that's, so you've seen how the gamma density works. Okay, so if I wanted, for example, the nth moment of a gamma, then how would that work? The nth moment, if x is gamma alpha n, then what's the expected value of x to the n? That would be equal to the integral x to the n x to the alpha minus 1, e to the minus lambda x. Then I have the, the appropriate density is I put this, it's lambda to the alpha over gamma of alpha in here. Because this is the density of the gamma. The point of this identity is if I flip the constant and put it on this side, I get the interval as 1. So that means, and so that corresponds to the fact that this is the density function, right? In other words, rewritten, this this identity that I have over here, this integration, is equivalent to integral zero to infinity, lambda to the alpha over gamma of alpha, x to the alpha minus one e to the minus lambda x dx is equal to one. So a lot of things are are kind of wrapped up into this identity, okay? A lot of things. The gamma function, uh, densities, things like that. So it's, it's, not, it's not a bad thing to memorize. It's been one of the baby foci of the course, the gamma density. It's been one of the topics. It's like, ah, know your calculus well, all right? Um, so then if I do that, what do I get? Notice if I take the nth moment, that's what this is called, the nth central moment. Uh, the reason is that x squared corresponds to a moment of inertia about the origin. X, the integration with x just corresponds to the center of mass, or probability mass. Remember that kind of stuff? This is the nth moment. From physics, what do you do? Right, if you've got a bunch of masses on the line, x, Little balls and big balls, right? Located. 
What? Go ahead. And then the same as the origin here. Okay. Yeah, you would take the, the, the you would take the mass. The mass is, is p of x one, let's say, p of x four, or something like that. The probabilities are the actual masses. All right. So it's probability mass, and you have the locations of the masses. So the center of mass is the first moment. So summation x i p i. Right? Summation xi p of xi is the center of mass. That's the mean or the first moment. Okay? About the origin. Because xi minus zero, you can talk about moments about axes. Okay? Moment about the origin. Okay? That gives you the center of mass relative to the origin. And you can talk about this um, second moment about the origin, okay? And that's, we don't really have a notation for that. Sometimes you call it mu sub 2. You want to call the moments mu sub n, mu sub 1. Mu sub 2 is summation xi minus 0 squared pxi. Okay, that's corresponds to the moment of inertia in physics. Displacement squared, okay? Sum up, alright? That's the second moment. These are moments. Okay. So I have this integral. If I wanted the nth moment in general, I can actually do it with all in one fell swoop because what do you have now? Now I can just use this identity up here. Because I can put the x to the n together with the x to the alpha minus 1, so now alpha would become alpha plus n. So then I, and then I, have to, I get this constant lambda alpha over gamma of alpha. Then I have what's left is an integral, which I just compute by this identity right here, where alpha is now n plus alpha. So I get times gamma of alpha plus n over lambda to the alpha plus n. Okay? So you just do it by the table and just read it off and then that gives you the answers on page A2 for the, uh, well, it doesn't tell you the all the moments, but practically you're done. Now, so I can cancel this alpha with this alpha and then I would have to if alpha was an integer, I can work this out explicitly in terms of factorials and so on. Otherwise, um, I just start to leave it like that. Okay? I can multiply it out using this that identity I had before. <coughs> so anyway, you get the the nth moment has a one over lambda to the nth in it. That's the basic um, thing. Notice it makes sense in the exponential density. Well, how does lambda work out? Let's look at a real life case. What is lambda in units? Let's say x was a time until um, um, a randomly chosen light bulb from the warehouse of light bulbs dies. Okay? So in other words, you turn it on and you wait until it dies. Okay? X, so x is the lifetime or death time of the light bulb. That's in hours, let's say. Right? What should lambda be in? One over hours. One over hours. That's right. Hour so minus one. So then the, the mean lifetime of the bulb is in one over lambda, hours. Mm -hmm. Expectation of the square lifetime, which should be hours squared, is one over lambda squared. Okay? Uh, actually, two over lambda squared here. Okay? This is a, the right units. It's hours squared. So you're following the leap units, so one over lambda for the mean, so you will now memorize this, okay? <laughs> so therefore, you know, it makes sense that the standard deviation, which is the square root of the variance, should also be in hours. Because the standard deviation, as you remember from the first course, is always in the same units as the mean. So it's natural to memorize that for the exponential density, the 
me is equal to the standard deviation equals 1 over lambda. How do I get the standard deviation equals 1 over lambda? You need a variance. I need to calculate the variance and then take the square root. So how do you calculate the variance of the exponential? Yeah. Well, the variance of any man for it. The variance of x is defined to be equal to not the second moment but the about the origin but the second moment about the mean. Okay. Or mu equals E of X. Now who knows the shortcut formula for that? E of X square minus E of X. A mean square. Right. Okay. Let's see. First, I think we went, did we go through the properties of the mean? I don't even know if we got that far when we did the introduction. How do I find, it turns out that, uh, well, I can write this out as integral x minus mu squared f of x dx, right? Minus infinity of infinity in the general case. So, I could expand that out and I'll get integral x squared minus 2 mu x plus mu squared f of x dx. I think it's the easiest way to see the properties of the expectation. The expectation is just integrated against the density. Integrate whatever it is in the jaws of the expectation against the density. And if there's more than one variable involved, it would be against the joint density. That's the law of the that's the law that's shown in general. Let me give this little example to motivate. Um, the general law on page 123, theorem B. Theorem B, if I have a, even a bunch of random variables, I want some to find the expectation of some function of those variables, I just integrate the function against the density. I'm using that in the univariate case in this example. And so what do you get? You just get this whole thing multiplied out. You get this to the term or term, right? Integral of the sum is the sum of integrals. So we get integral x squared, f of x dx. I can pull the mu out integral x f of x dx, and then plus mu squared times integral f of x dx. Are all integrals minus infinity to infinity? What is integral f of x dx? In general, that's just one. That's just one, right? That's the density, so it's just one. Integral x f of x dx, that's what I'm calling mu. And here, x squared f of x dx, that's what I'm calling the second moment. And so I'll just write this as squared minus 2 mu e of x plus mu squared times 1 e of x to the 0, if you like. All right? It's 1. E x is just another symbol for mu. So this is e of x squared minus 2 mu times mu plus mu squared. All right. Let's see that. Or mu is e, e of x. OK, so I'm not trying to confuse here or go too fast. But this is the, the computation that Everyone has to go through at least once or twice or three times in their life. We've probably already been through it a few times from your previous course. And so you get the expectation of the square minus the square of the expectation of x. So the mean square minus the square mean. So does this prove the mean function is linear? Yeah, it proves that. The expectation operation is linear. 
It doesn't prove it, but it's a, an example of that law, which is another thing. The expectation is linear, is uh, another theorem in here. Um, in particular, a, co a consequence of this theorem B is in the next section, theorem A on page 125. That the expectation is a linear operation. The expectation of a constant is the constant. The expectation of uh, mu squared, for example, I could have written this out also as e of x squared. Another shortcut would have been e of x squared minus 2 mu x plus mu squared. The expectation is linear means I just get this ex squared minus 2 mu ex, I can pull the constants out, plus e of mu squared. All right? And e of mu squared is just mu squared. Okay, mu squared times 1. So this is e of x squared, as before, minus 2 mu e times mu plus mu squared. The expectation of a constant is a constant. Alright. So then you get this shortcut form, so-called shortcut formula for the variance, the expectation of the square minus the square of the expectation of the variable. Means what mean of the square minus the square of the mean is another way to say it. And in particular, a corollary automatically, since this is a non negative quantity, is that mu squared is always less than or equal to e of x squared. So, okay. So that, for the exponential variable, then what do I get? So if x is exponential, we've got to have all the ingredients in place. And so that one hint of the one problem is taking us half a lecture to get there. <laughs> but this is the way it is. So if x is exponential with parameter lambda, then the standard deviation of x, which you know from the previous course, is equal to the square root of the variance of x. That is equal to the expectation of the square, minus the square of the expectation, e of x, I'll write it this way, is equal to, we just computed for the exponential case is 2 over lambda squared for the expectation squared. We also computed that the mean is 1 over lambda. So we'll square that. And I get that. 2 over lambda squared minus 1 over lambda squared equals 1 over lambda squared. Uh, I should have taken the square root where variance of x, let's put that in another line, where variance of x is equal to this. Therefore, the standard deviation of x is more of a lambda. It's the same. We're going over lambda, yeah. So the standard deviation is the same as the mean. So if I draw a picture, which I like pictures, I have the exponential density, x. Here's my exponential density. f of x equals lambda e to the minus lambda x. Correct positive. The mean is 1 over lambda. Let's just put there 1 over lambda, which would be in hours if lambda was in hours to the minus 1. And then one standard one, and then one standard, one standard deviation below the mean is already at zero. So you can only go one standard deviation below the mean that you get uh, the lowest possible value of the random variable. Then you have one standard deviation, one standard deviation above, and so on. So if I want to write it down in terms of, if I write, if, if we write mu equals ex and sigma equals the standard deviation of x, okay, which is, which is pretty standard notation. And it matches the fact that the, the 
mean and the standard deviation of a normal random variable are indeed built parameters mu with sigma defining the normal density. Should I say that again? Can you hear that? Uh, if I actually, you know, write down the normal density, it has a mu and a sigma in it. You know, I don't know if you remember how that formula goes. I don't have to write it down. You can look it in the book. Okay? Then they ask you, if you calculate the mean by integrating x against the density and blah, 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 you actually get mu. Okay? And if you find the standard deviation by the same type of calculations, you actually get sigma. Okay? So mu and sigma are the parameters of normal density, but they actually also are the mean and standard deviation. Okay? So then, because of that context, they became kind of a catch-all for the mean and the standard deviation. So if I write that, and here, this is mu is 1 over lambda. Mu plus 1 standard deviation would therefore be 2 over lambda. Okay? Mu minus sigma, 1 standard deviation below the mean would be 0. Okay? For the exponential variable. So for a normal curve, you'd have Below. No, you run out of room. <laughs> okay. So then one of your problems is to actually compute the probability that um, what's the probability minus mu is bigger than or equal to k sigma. Okay. For the exponential case. For k equals two and for k equals two and three. I think it was two and three or something. Or two, two and a half, and three. What would that be in terms of this picture? This would say that I'm k standard deviations away from the mean. Okay. Right. So in terms of a picture, that means. Right, how would I, in terms of the picture of the density, what kind of region am I integrating over? So I'm just going to write this probability as an integral against the density, right? And if there's no x's, it's just going to be an interval, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be a certain interval, okay? And what's the interval going to be? 3 over lambda is like all the parts. So here's mu plus sigma. Here's mu plus 2 sigma. Okay, so that means I have to have x bigger than mu plus 2 sigma, okay? Right? So this is a k equals 2 case. I'm going to integrate out here. All right, I'm not going to integrate anything over here. This is going to be, this is going to, there's only going to be one piece to this interval because there's nothing to integrate over here. Okay, zero. This is new minus two sigma here. Okay, it's zero density there. So that's just from three over lambda to infinity, right? So in case k equals two, I'm going to get. 3 over lambda to infinity e to the minus, lambda e to the minus lambda x dx. That comes out to for k equals 2, which comes out to be a number independent of lambda. It doesn't depend on lambda. That's what's confusing about this problem a little bit. The antiderivative is e to the minus lambda x with a minus sign in front, so when I put the 3 over lambda in, I get e to the minus 3. So for exponential, the probabilities of um, x minus mu minus greater than k lambda is just e to the negative k or k plus uh, 1. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, you get e to the minus k plus 1. This is, so if I rewrite this, this is probably the x minus 1 over lambda, right, greater than equal to k over lambda. As long as k is greater than equal to 1, this comes out to be equals e to the minus k plus 1. K greater than one. That's what you were saying. Yeah, that's correct. For the exponential case, exponential only. Okay, exponential lambda. X exponential lambda implies this. Okay, let me erase all the rest of the stuff so it's visible what we're talking about. Okay, great.
Security One. This was a picture for KD Two. The reason that this is interesting is that there's a Chevy Chevy inequality. It gives you a general statement about how to estimate this probability. Does anybody remember that? Oh boy. 381, Chevy Chevy inequality. Well, you can look it up in the book. Maybe I should just mention it at this moment. What is Chevy Chevy's inequality? <laughs> if I have a general density, let's say a normal, you know, normal, it could be anything, uniform, whatever, okay? Arbitrary. Then the expect the probability that X Chevy Chev inequality. States that the probability of x minus u very equal to k sigma. How would I? How could I do that? Well, so this is this is sort of the question: is is the, the standard deviation and the mean which have been defined? Uh, do those two parameters together somehow control this probability? Okay, in some way. In other words, could I get could I beat ten standard deviations away from the mean? Well, in other words, if I put k equals a 10 here, and somehow the standard deviation is given, the mean is given, uh, this is the probability that I'm at least 10 standard deviations away from the mean. Should that be somehow controlled? Yeah, you would think so. The fact that the standard deviation involves the, the second moment. density here, whatever it may look like, um, and it actually does have a mean and a standard deviation, in other words, the first and second, well, what that means is that the second moment has to exist in order to have the standard deviation, the second moment must exist. You have some homework problems where they're talking about, well, find the second moment whenever it makes sense. And that was part of the answers I was given on the board earlier. I said, had conditions like alpha bigger than one. The second moment, the first moment might not exist unless they put a condition. Parameters of the density. Alright? So as long as there's a second moment, I can I can talk about this. So the so already we're talking about a restricted class of densities, the ones that have second moments. That's implied by this. And only random variables that have a second moment. Then if that's the case, the fact that it has a second moment, can I somehow, and it has a mean, so there's some center of mass in some moment of inertia of the probability mass. Okay. Um, <clears throat> somehow does that control the fact that, you know, that I can be, you know, if I take this scale for the standard deviation, does that actually control the probability? Is out there? And the answer is yes. Okay. The easy calculation is again not that easy, but this is integral x minus mu. How I do probability is I always just integrate the density. So I have the values of x is x minus mu minus is greater than k sigma. So it's a certain it's a couple intervals here. This is mu plus k sigma. And this is mu minus k sigma, and I'm going to integrate over here, I'm going to integrate over here, okay? Now what I'm going to do is, to estimate this integral is a, is a, a trick that was um, introduced by Markov, I believe. That was a, he got his name after it, anyway. The trick is basically, you've got, this is a positive integrand, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make it bigger and get an upper estimate. How can I make it bigger? I can make it bigger by saying, well, the region I'll, over the region of integration, I've got x minus mu is greater equal to k sigma. So if I just take the ratio of those two, I can multiply this number of x by a number bigger than one. That makes it bigger. So integral x minus mu over k sigma. Well, I'm going to square that. In fact, that still makes it bigger. That makes dx. And now I could throw in the whole region of integration. 
minus infinity to infinity, and that still makes it bigger yet. Okay? So actually, you should always do it in two steps so that you can follow it. So I'll say it's a set of all x's, but x minus mu is greater than or equal to k sigma. You first step, because obviously now I've made the integrand bigger. Then in the next step, you just throw away, you just, I mean, you just um, add in some more. By throwing in the whole rigid of integration. Okay? And now, what's happening is that the k squared and the sigma squared are constants relative to x. So that's 1 over k squared and sigma squared outside. And what's left is the definition of the variance, which is sigma squared. So this is just equals this. And so that equals 1 over k squared. So you do. You do have control over this probability of far out in the tails, so-called tails density, or the distribution. And that's a chevy chevy inequality. So the chance that I'm at least 10 standard deviations away from the mean, when I do in fact have a standard deviation of mean existing, okay, is at most 1 over 100. So there are densities uh, there are densities, it turns out, that uh, approximate that bad behavior. This is kind of the worst behavior you can have. And what you're they're asking for in your problems is, well, compare that with k equal to 10 to this business over here. This is e to the minus 11 versus 1 over 100. This is quite a bit smaller. <laughs> okay. All right? All right? Quite a bit small. So Chevy Chevy bound is general, but it's, it's, it's kind of poor telling you how much probability is in the tails for you know, really far off tails. So it actually gives you a way of talking about tails and so on. It gives you the basic estimate. Okay? So we've gone through variance, uh, the definition, and let's see, I think I have some more notes, notes 10. This is going to be variance of a sum and so on. Um, is everybody going to feel okay with their homework now? They have to do all these means and stuff. Got to do all these means and use chevy chevy inequality. I don't think it was too bad. They didn't have to derive all these laws of the expectation. There's a bunch of these theorems in here. So let's see, what else did you have in your I see, yes. There's the one there's one trick I didn't cover. And that is have there's a long example on um, DNA splicing and so on. Okay. So what? DNA. A, and contigs and uh, things like that. Basically what they're doing is is analyzing um, it's kind of a nice example, Mewish talk about that a little bit. So we have about five, ten minutes left. Or do we? No, we're almost out of time. We have two minutes left. Yeah, on example A, page 126, they have a long example. It's a good example. Uh, really, the basic idea that wasn't clear was how they actually um, tried to map the DNA. Um, apparently, um, what they do is they take a segment of DNA they want to map, or somehow put together, and they just take, um, they don't just take one strand of the DNA, they take a bunch of strands of the DNA, they just have it all chopped up. So you have a whole bowl of alphabet soup. Okay? <laughs> okay. And so you have strings of letters, okay, maybe they're, uh, the strings might be um, at least 500 long, okay? You have strings, 500, so maybe it's, it's noodle soup and noodle soup chopped, okay? Okay.
okay? So you have these little noodlets, okay? And you're trying to... You can tell it's lunchtime. You can tell you're trying to construct the whole strand of the big noodle, okay? So anyway, these little noodle, little baby noodles could come from anywhere in the big long strand. And so uh, they actually, what you, you model is that they, the left hand endpoint of the little noodle could come from uniformly distributed along the big strand. Okay, so you have the big strand, and you have the left hand endpoint of the little noodle could be any point uniformly distributed, basically, discrete uniform from zero to the total length of the strand. The total length of the strand is supposed to be G, the grand length, I guess, I don't know why they call it G, and then the little noodle had length L, okay? And so you get this, 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 uh, that's the model, okay? That, that, so then you got to get a bunch of these things, and how many should you pick, you know, to sort of know that, you know, what you're going to do is you're going to just pick a bunch of these little L's, okay? But they, you can make big gaps in here, right? So you want to make sure that there's not too many gaps, so that you can somehow by somehow by putting the puzzle together, which you need enough puzzle pieces in order to somehow put the puzzle together. All right, you might have multiple pieces like this, right, that overlap a lot. But that's all you do. You figure it out eventually. Okay, it's like people put the puzzle together somehow. And the question is, how many, you know, how much overlap should you do? How many should you pull out of the soup? I to try to pass it. And so that's what the example is about. We don't have time to finish discussing it. But, um, but you might say, but well, one of the questions is, it has related to what's the expected uh, but then then they go on to another example is what's the let's say let's say one of the sequences I'm interested in is this. Okay? T A T A. For you usually have A G C T or whatever for four letters of G of the genetic code. Suppose I'm lo looking at just this four letter sequence. Okay, how many times could I expect that to have occurred in this whole genome? That sequence. How would you figure out? How many times did it actually occur? Assuming that T's, A's, C's, and G's all occur with probability of one quarter. How many, if everything was completely random, okay? How many times would that appear? Including overlaps. In other words, it doesn't have to be separate occurrences. In other words, if I had T, A, T, A, T, A, and then G, C, T, A, 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 T, T, A, T, A. How many times does it occur in that sequence? One, two, Four. Three. Three. One, two, two, three. Three. Okay, it occurs three times. So there was overlap here, right? Now it looks like a difficult question to figure out how many, what's the expected number of times you would get it. But expected number is kind of interesting. The reason, way you can, the trick you can use is basically this. You basically represent the number of times that it occurs. The number of times it occurs. Number of n equals number of times this ta ta occurs. is uh, can be represented the following. You look at each position along the genome, okay, and you figure out whether it would occur or not at that position. Let's say looking to the left. You can either look to the left or look to the right or look at the middle. Okay. But in other words, if I look here, what's the chance that um, maybe that was the A and this is the T and this is the A and this is the T. Okay? So let's 
say it just occurred to the, to, to the left, okay? And say so indicate one if it did and zero if it didn't. So I so x well position x I don't know position j equals one or zero if contar occurs at position j and zero otherwise. And so then if I add all those up, I will have total number of occurrences, right? Because that's allowing for overlap, obviously. Okay, just look to the left if it occurred. Oh, yeah. Here I looked, it did occur. Here I looked, it didn't occur. Here I looked, it did occur. Okay? So I had, and here, if this was the beginning, of course, I had zero. It didn't occur to the left because there was nothing there. So zero plus zero plus zero plus one plus zero plus one plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus one at the end here. Okay? A bunch of zeros and ones. So it's a bunch of zeros and ones that I'm adding up. So n is equal to the summation i sub j. J goes from, not from, uh, you can start from, uh, what? The fourth index all the way up to the length of the genome. Okay? So what's now, what's now expected value then is by the linearity, the summation of the expected value to i sub j. That's the trick. The expectation is linear. So even though the distribution of this capital N may be difficult, um, you can at least find the expectation fairly easily this way by using this indicator. And so what's the expected value of this indicator? If there's a one zero value of random variable, the expected value of the indicator is just the probability of getting a one. If one times the probability of the one, plus zero times the probability of the zero. So the expected value is equal to the probability, ij is equal to 1. What's the probability ij equal to 1? Well, what's the chance that if I'm, you know, flipping a four-sided coin, that the four previous times they got T A T A. One-fourth to the fourth. Okay? So then you just add this up. So that should be true. So I just give you the other problem. Kind of. <laughs> There's another problem that we're doing this. So I'm sorry for taking overtime. If I have a look at your problem, I think you should be able to do your problem. Good effort. Somebody asked me if they were going to be any take-home tests. Well, that is your take-home, your homework, so to speak. You know? I'll, maybe I'll drop off the two or something. But I think I'm going to stay with the in-class tests. I like the in-class tests. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.